Welcome back to the Athlete Hackers Podcast. My name is Chris Schrade. And I'm Mark Spellman. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have the pleasure and the honor of having one of my mentors and one of the individuals that I consider uh, not only one of the best in the profession, but also a pioneer for how he does things and what he does and how he does it and all the what, whys, and hows that he covers. But before we get to Coach Asanovich, uh, as you know, we start the podcast with a couple quick takeaways from previous podcasts. So from the one with uh, Coach MT from the University of Colorado, the blending of technology and performance um, to understand why you're using technology and what question, uh, the question that you should have before you use technology is what uh, are you looking at and what question are you trying to answer with the technology that you're using? And then uh, the next podcast with Coach Moore from NC State, the importance of coaches and understanding the female athletes that they work with and how they can uh, optimize the menstrual cycle for performance and to better understand their female athletes. Cutting edge athlete hacking. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know too many um, podcasts out there, especially male podcasts that are talking about the uh, female athlete uh, and their menstrual cycle. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a fine tightrope to walk. I don't <laughs> think we got ourselves in trouble on that one. I think we did good. No, we did. We did. I think we, I think we uh, were very good. In fact, Sam, Sam blew my mind as always. So yeah. without yeah. further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to have coach Asanovich join us today. Mark, how are you? What's going on? How's the family? I'm doing real good. Uh, we're all happy and healthy and um, uh, enjoying the new uh, uh, summer weather up here. Uh, we're used to snow and uh, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a nice break. Thanks for coming out, Coach. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Um, so for the people that do not know uh, Coach Asanovich, uh, please go into your background and your career path and where you are and what you're doing now, if you could. Well, um, uh, I started off uh, in, in the college ranks actually at Ohio State this way back in 84, 85. I um, uh, was the first strength coach at the Citadel uh, for exactly one year. Then was at the uh, high school for um, uh, nine years at Anoka High School in Minneapolis. Minnesota, and during that time, starting in 1990, Danny Green was hired by the um, Minnesota Vikings, and I volunteered with the Vikings for nine years before I was hired as the assistant strength coach there. Uh, when Coach Dungey went to um, Tampa Bay, he took me with him. I met Mark, and um, uh, after that, uh, I was a season with the uh, Baltimore Ravens. After that, I was uh, seven years at um, uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars and uh, finished my professional football career in the UFL with the uh, Hartford Colonials. Uh, currently, I'm uh, coaching and teaching uh, at one of the larger high schools in Minneapolis, um, Minnetonka High School. But my uh, current um, uh, passion right now is educating coaches, teachers, other stakeholders about the uh, importance of head and neck strengthening in mitigating uh, spinal cord and traumatic brain injury. Mm. Yeah, um, for those that don't know, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, intern with Coach Asanovich. Um, and there are a bunch of us that have branched off of his coaching tree to uh, uh, try and be as successful and as impactful as he has been in the profession. Um, Coach, did you say that you volunteered for nine years before you got an assistant position? Uh, unpaid, unpaid volunteer for nine years, yeah. This is just a theme that keeps repeating itself with a lot of our, our guests, this long-term just commitment with no pay until they finally get in. Well, the NFL likes no pay 
Most they help. <laughs> so, um, uh, and that that's kind of what Mark was with uh, with with uh, Tampa too. So, uh, but it, it you know it's called getting your paying your dues and getting your feet wet. Hmm. So for a lot of a lot of young strength coaches coming into the profession that you know are, are a year or two out of college, understand that there's a path that you're going to have to take, and that it's not a short path for most people. Um, it is it is definitely a profession of um, attrition. The people that stay stay with it the longest will be around the longest. So continue to keep uh, getting better at your trade. Keep reaching out to the people that have come before you. Honor the people that have come before you uh, with an attitude of gratitude and make sure that you, you keep getting better at your craft and, and never give up, uh, you know, nine years to become an assistant. How many more years as an assistant before you became a head? I was uh, one year as an assistant and then Tony left and asked me to go with him. Okay, so I mean, you're looking at a decade. <laughs> you know, to become a head. And, and, and I think when my mom and dad came to visit uh, me when I was down in Tampa, you, you, you told them you, your son has a better chance of being a congressman than he does uh, an NFL strength coach. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's a fact. I mean, there's, there's 30 teams. Um, I think probably when, when we were with Tampa, there were probably on average two to three strength coaches per team. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at 60 to 90 and that's 60 to nine opportunities in the world. Mm -hmm. Not just, not just anywhere else, but you know, that's 60 to 90. So people, I think don't get frustrated if, if you are applying for jobs and not getting them, continue to keep going after it, but also find something that you're passionate about. And, and a niche that you can find in, in, in the market. And one of the things, you know, when I, when I became a head strength coach at Fairfield University, one of the things that we did, and I took uh, from you, thankfully, was that we uh, stressed the importance of training your neck and your shoulder girdle for the athletes. Um, so briefly explain why it's important, not only for um, combat athletics, like football, football, ice hockey, lacrosse, wrestling, to train the neck and the shoulder girdle, but all M sports. MMA. Yeah, it, um, in order to uh, mitigate or prevent an injury, it, it's first, the, for, you have to understand the mechanism of the injury. So the mechanism of concussion is, uh, it's an acceleration, deacceleration injury to your head. So either the head is hit directly or there's a hit to the other part of the body that causes a whiplashing in the neck. Um, and so when the head is uh, accelerated and then deaccelerated, like in a whiplashing effect, the brain, which is free floating inside your skull is twisting and turning and at a microscopic level, uh, axons and brain tissue is, uh, they're under a stretch and they tear and they ca cause microscopic damage or death to the cell. Now the, the brain is a, what's called a my, 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 my topic organ, which means that once there's damage, the damage is done permanently. So, uh, in order to decrease the acceleration of the head, the neck is responsible for all head and head movement and positioning. So uh, the science clearly shows that if you have a stronger neck upon impact, it will slow the head down. And if we can slow the head down, we can slow the brain down. If we can slow the brain down, we can slow the mechanism of concussion down. So um, it's not happening a lot right now. Coaches still don't understand the importance of training the neck. And as I said at the beginning of the show, that's kind of my passion to do that right now. Um, I also mentioned it also mitigates um, spinal cord injury. We know from science very clearly 
that when you train muscle, you also train, there's a the systemic effect on other systems in the body, one of which is your bones. When you strengthen muscle, you increase bone mineral density to the bones. They actually get thicker and stronger, as do the tendons and ligaments. So as you train the musculature of the neck, the cervical facets get thicker and stronger. They house your spinal cord. So as they become thicker and stronger, you are less likely to get compression injury and spinal cord injury. So um, one thing that I would like to see uh, before I end my career is uh, when coaches prescribe exercise, the first priority they are thinking of, make sure that spinal cords and brains are protected through head and neck strengthening. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, um, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to mentor under some incredible people as, as, as you know, yourself being one of them, but also Dan Riley and Jeff Watson. Um, so we all kind of follow, we all kind of fall off the same tree. Um, with the understanding of how important it is to train the neck. And um, I mean, when we were, when I was with Tampa with you, it was the first thing that we trained, you know, if, and, and all the athletes knew, all the players knew it, if they were coming in to get a lift in, or when they did come in to uh, get a lift in, that we would start with their neck. And we had multiple ways to train their neck. And it depended on uh, what card they pulled for the day with how we were going to train it. Um, with that being said, get, touch a little bit on the, the five P approach to your training, uh, philosophy and how you would implement that for, uh, not, not only a professional athlete, but a, a youth athlete. Well, it originally started as four P's as you know, but I, I, I did have to, uh, in our current environment at, at a fifth P and it's, um, uh, the principles of strength training should be prudent, productive, practical, purposeful, and the fifth P I added was politically correct now. Um, and I'll explain each one. The first one is prudent. Prudent simply means safe. Um, and as a strength coach, uh, the reason why we train neck first is because our first and foremost responsibility is to protect our athletes from the rigors of sport. And if the most catastrophic risk is brain and spinal cord injury, then it behooves us to prescribe exercise for the neck and shoulder girdle like you were talking about. And that's why the first thing we did was protect their brains and spinal cords. Um, so we have to take a look at that. We have to take, we were talking earlier about uh, bringing kids back from uh, COVID too. We've got to keep that in mind that our first job is not performance enhancement. Our first job is to do things that are gonna protect kids from injury. Uh, the second uh, P has to do with productive. And um, now you have to look at the science. What gives you the most productive results? Well. You know, I call myself a dumbbell coach because it's not hard to understand. Uh, what's going to give you the maximum results is working hard. Um, so it starts with the athletes. And as a strength coach, uh, it behooves you to make relationships with your athletes because some athletes like to be kicked in the butt. Other people like to be patted on the butt. But as a strength coach, you need to know what is going to motivate your athletes to get the uh, maximum effort out of them? And if they're giving maximum effort, they're lifting weights and not throwing weights, they're going through the full range of motion, you're going to get great results. Um, so you've got to be prudent, it's got to be productive, it's got to be practical. Uh, practical simply means when you've got a hundred kids standing at your door and you've got a weight room with um, five racks, five benches, and 
uh, various dumbbells, you've got to have the administrative skills to take them through a total body workout in a um, practical amount of time, let's say it's an hour, and get them through that safely. I always thought it kind of funny at the NFL level where we had unlimited resources, we had uh, a one to four coaching ratio and, and stuff like that, people would come to us uh, to look at, you know, how do you do things in the weight room? And I, I would always tell them, and Mark, you probably heard me a couple of times, is show up at a high school where a coach does have all these limitations. He's got three racks, he's got three benches, he's got a couple dumbbells, but he's got a couple hundred kids that he's got to run through in a day. Look at how he administers that in a safe fashion. Yeah, looking at looking at looking at at the NFL level and trying to apply it to a collegiate or high school setting, not practical because I mean I know I know especially like during mini camp, we had one there was one strength coach for every two two exercises, and sometimes we had one strength coach for every exercise. Yeah, and and we got we got a hundred guys through in like an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I mean, once again, the riches of the NFL kind of hard to kind of hard to apply that to the high school or even, you know, the setting that I was at Fairfield where I had 50, 50 lacrosse guys. I had, I was fortunate enough that I had enough equipment, but there was only one of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, You've got to be prudent, you've got to be productive, you've got to be practical, and you've got to be purposeful. Purposeful just simply means that you have to understand who and what you're training, whether it's kids or professionals or uh, whether it's males or females, whether it's um, martial artists or football players. Uh, purposeful um, is a very important um, uh, principle to follow because when I go into most weight rooms around the country, um, I'm asking myself, are you training power lifters, Olympic lifters, or are you training athletes? And I think most models that are used today in mainstream strength training is power lifting models and Olympic weight lifting models, and they're be a, being applied to other sports. So I, I, I don't think, um, uh, Many models are purposeful. So uh, <clears throat> those are the four principles that I always followed in my career. But seeing what I see now in, in some of the training, um, I tell coaches that you also have to be politically correct. And that means um, uh, athletes now, when they come in the weight room, they're used to seeing uh, both you balls. You know, everything has to be done. Every exercise has to be done in uh, what most people term a functional manner, which really um, mystifies me because I'll turn around and ask them, well, what makes an exercise non-functional? And I never, never usually get a, get a response back from that. But um, many people apply, uh, imply that you have to be an, on a physio ball now to to get a decent strength training program in. <clears throat> so what I advise coaches as far as being politically correct is bringing in some of these things to make yourself relevant. Uh, at Jacksonville, I brought in 50 physio balls. We hung them on the, on the wall. Uh, we very rarely used them, but just by being on the wall, we were relevant. We were current. We were uh, on the cusp of science. <laughs> yeah, that's what the perception was. So um, we were politically correct. So, well, one, you know, as the saying goes, uh, you know, perception, perception is reality sometimes. And yeah. I think, you know, get, getting back to the BOSU, the BOSU ball, if people don't understand it on the BOSU ball, it, it is, it is printed on the a piece of equipment that you're not, you shouldn't stand on it the way that everybody stands on it, where they stand on, they stand on the flat side. It actually says on the piece of equipment that you're not supposed to stand on this side 
And if you do stand on this side and something happens, it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, little... another, another example, Mark, would be the, the battling ropes. Okay, now, as an exercise physiologist, again, I'm thinking purposeful. Uh, the purpose of exercise, you know, and ask, ask these strength coaches that, what is the purpose of exercise? And the purpose of exercise is to introduce an exercise that's going to cause a physiological adaptation. So when you look at an exercise, when I look at an exercise, like the battling ropes, I'm asking myself, what is the physiological adaptation of that? And I'll ask the practitioner who prescribed that, what is the physical, physiological adaptation? And many times they don't know, but everybody else is doing it, so they're gonna do it. So you really have to ask yourself the purpose behind every exercise that you prescribe. I think one of the one of the funny things that you know you told me when we first started many moons ago, and it was the first question that you had for uh, Bill, Dave, and myself, what is strength? And and I think you as many clinics and seminars you've been to i think you've asked over probably close to a thousand strength coaches to define strength and i think you have a thousand different um answers yeah so, I well i think as as a, as a strength coach that's probably a good question to start with <laughs> because um how you, how you define it is going to de determine how you develop it and how you uh, measure it definitely so. coach um going back to the next strengthening and uh the concussion uh conversation um how does that play in with younger athletes um you know namely the kids that are probably somewhere between fourth and eighth grade that are going to start playing football um you know i as a father i've i've avoided my son playing because it's you know I don't care if he breaks an arm or a leg, but you know, it's, it's the head injuries and that trauma um, and what's going to happen as he's developing, um, you know, in that, that the most important region of, of our body. Um, is there a way for kids of that age to start to, to strengthen their neck and their shoulder girdle so that um, they can avoid that type of injury? Well, Chris, the, the research says whether you're eight or 88, if you apply an overload to our physiology, there will be an adaptive response. Okay, so if you apply a safe overload to a youth neck, they will get stronger. Um, and I think um, if we back up a little bit in talking about concussions, uh, the problem with concussions with a lot of coaches and parents is that it's an invisible injury. Um, unlike an ankle, when you sprain an ankle, ankles will blow up, they'll turn purple, they'll, you know, you can see, objectively see the damage. Well, when there's damage at the microscopic level in the brain, you can't see it. Mm. Yeah, so it's out of sight, out of mind. So people have, minimize this injury over time. That's why we use euphemisms like getting your bell rung or uh, being dinged or uh, something that you can't see the injury. The other thing is you don't have pain proprioceptors in your uh, brain. So not only can you not see it, you can't feel it. Now you can experience symptoms. So, um, I think people are just realizing now with all the awareness campaigns that have been done, that when you damage your brain, you damage your identity. You ident damage who you are. You said your son uh, isn't playing football. My, my son isn't playing football either because I don't wanna lose that kid's identity. I don't want his future hurt because he has damaged his brain uh, playing a sport. Yeah. And you mentioned youth brains. Youth brains at that uh, level that you 
those brains are, are developing at that point. They're getting millenniated and everything like that. Now you're putting repetitive uh, brain trauma and exposing them to that through sport. Uh, it's just not um, uh, practical. In fact, um, uh, there is an epidemiologist. Her name was Kathleen. Her last name starts with a B. She calls it a moral abdication. So um, those are pretty strong words, but it's a pretty strong organ that you're damaging. Um, I read an article last year that just devastated me on this subject. And it was about, uh, I, think, I think the child was 13 years old. He'd been playing since he was 10, um, you know, and he was, he was a lineman. So he was, you know, constantly taking blows. He's one of the bigger kids. And uh, like you said, um, it was almost like his identity completely changed, you know, and within, I think, three or four months of that happening, he committed suicide at 13 years old. It's yeah. Devastating. Yeah. And unfortunately, I read stories like that uh, every single day. And the question I ask parents um, is, what blow to the head is a good blow to the head? And, and, and I think but, what a lot of coaches need to understand, it might not be that big hit in the game, but it's the repetitive, the repetitive blows in practice that add up and are the ones that are really the, the damaging ones. Yeah, we've all seen the big hits. I mean, the NFL puts out a highlight film of big hits. ESPN does it. But it's the, it's the, the daily, you know, we've both been on the sideline during practice and games. I mean, these are car crashes these guys are going into repetitively. If a practice is two hours, they're probably going through 50 at a low end, 50, 50 head-on collisions with the person across the line from them. And yeah. it's as we know, these, these individuals can create a lot of force and a lot of power in a very small, small amount of time and distance. But for the youth coaches, they need to understand that the repetitive nature of hitting each other probably isn't the best way to serve their, serve their athlete and the children the best. That's, that's, that's a completely interesting point because we talk about repetitive motion injuries here all the time. And to you, your point, coach, you're dealing with a part of the body that you have no pain receptors in. So you don't even know that the injury is taking place while you're doing that repetitive motion injury. And not only that you, you don't know that the injury is taking place is uh, it's permanent. The damage is permanent. And uh, when they talk about brain plasticity, the brain has the ability to try to rewire, go around a different pathway. But uh, once a cell dies, it is dead forever in the brain. It you does know, not come back. You know, they say that there's all kinds of research out now that says that our brains don't stop, stop developing till we're 25 years old. You know, it, you look at where you had college and the average lifespan of a of an NFL football career, by the time your your brain's developing, you're already retired. So, what um, is there a safe age to start this process where you're taking this risk with obviously the the appropriate training program? Uh, I I think the um issue right now is around uh, informed consent. You know, when an individual is an adult, they can look ahead and make decisions. Um, I am willing to risk my identity. I am willing to risk my brain. I'm willing to risk future health, neurological health by participating in this. You can make decisions like that when you're adult, hmm. but uh, before you're adult, so when you talk about age, Chris, I'm talking about age 18, when you turn adulthood, then you can start making those decisions. The problem right now is adults are making decisions for uh, kids who have developing brains, and they're saying, um, you know, I can 
I, as an adult, I'm going to allow my son to, to do this. Well, you're, again, you're throwing the dice on your son's neurological health. And um, people are saying, we don't want the government um, uh, telling us what we can do with our children and stuff like that. Well, sometimes you got to protect people from themselves because they're not totally educated as to their um, as to the dangers and risks that they're allowing their kids to take. We've we you look at our our history and our culture. We're always protecting our children. We're taking lead out of paint. Um, we don't allow children to drink at a certain age. We don't allow, you know, cigarettes and stuff like that. Uh, it, it should be the same way with protecting kids from exposing them to brain damage in sport. When, uh, when you were in the NFL, were the players aware of or were they informed about the risks that they were taking? Or was that something that the league and teams didn't want to talk about? Well, when I was in the league, it, it was uh, still a badge of honor to be uh, knock silly or to get a ding or, you know, the guys would be comparing the dents in their helmets the next day in the locker room and stuff like that. Um, I was even on the sideline uh, one time and I heard a trainer point blank tell a player, uh, this is a trainer now, the medical authority on the bench telling the player that he made too much money to uh, be out with a concussion. So, you know, get your ass back on the field. Um, so no, at that time, players or coaches, myself included, um, or trainers were not uh, aware of the significant damage that went with um, not only concussive hits that you talked about, Mark, which is, which is brain damage with symptoms, or subconcussive hits, again, brain damage without symptoms. So I uh, know uh, players and coaches, we were not aware of the damage that was going on. Do you, do you think it's getting better at the collegiate and professional level now with all the information that is there to support? You know, this is, this is something that we need to take a look at and, and, and do better by our athletes. You know, it's kind of a mixed bag right now because there's some surveys that show that coaches are still unaware of what's going on. But with all the awareness programs that have been going on, I, I think, I mean, you take a look at the numbers in youth football that are going down. So the message is getting out there. Parents are aware now of brain damage. Um, but we got to take the next step. We, we, being aware of something isn't going to prevent something or mitigate something. We need to take the next steps right now and, um, uh, you know, expose youth brains to less uh, brain damage exposure. Um, a couple of years back, uh, my stepson's 22 now, so uh, we're going back, well, I guess, eight years, um, he played freshman football. And uh, at the time that they were, they were touting the, the baseline measurement. Um, is that an effective way to gauge, uh, you know, and obviously it's, it's taking place after the fact. So the damage is done if you're taking the, the second test, but is that an effective way to actually gauge the damage that someone takes after a concussion? Absolutely not. The research is conclusive on that. And there's so many uh, false negatives uh, on those tests. And the problem is um, you really need uh, neurologists reading those tests. And now you have coaches and athletic trainers doing these computerized tests. Huh. And, and they're not. And of course, they are their stakeholders and they want the kids playing and stuff like that. So they're interpreting these results. And um, uh, when they first came out, uh, uh, Peyton Manning even faked uh, his baseline tests so that if he was concussed, um, you know, the baseline would be very similar to what he would do in a concussed situation. So, so he shanked answers? He, he, he answered incorrectly on purpose? Exactly. And he was <laughs> caught doing it. So... Um, and he even, you know, at that time, it was it was kind of a joke. He said, well, you know, if I get concussed, I'll have a better concussion score, you know. And, 
and I don't think Peyton was aware of, 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 of the consequences of brain damage like he is now. Hmm. I had, but, I had um, a bunch of, we did baseline testing at Fairfield for the men's lacrosse team, and a bunch of them did that. They shanked the, yeah. I mean, they shanked the first test, and they're like, yeah, we did it so that, you know, we know we're going to get, we know we're going to get our bell rung. So, you know, if we have to go into the protocol, we know that our baseline test is so bad that when we have to retake this test, it's going to be close to our baseline. And I was like, I, I, I thought to myself, I was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, and, um, and concussion is a clinical diagnosis and you can't make it off a computerized test. And unfortunately, these computerized uh, neurological tests uh, have been just kind of a, what I call a concussion incorporated, a money maker for these guys that have have done this. But it's it's been shown time and time again that it it may be used as a little piece, but uh, it can't be used as the major determinant of because what what what's happening right now in most high schools is a kid gets on a bike and he pedals for 20 minutes without symptoms and he passes his baseline test. And he says, you're ready to go. And I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this kid is 30 pounds shy in his neck flexion and he's 40 pounds shy in his extension. And you know, he's 30 pounds weaker in the lateral flexion of his neck. He, this kid is more exposed to brain damage right now. So uh, no, those baseline tests are, um, are not the way to go. Hmm. Are there any studies out there or resources showing that um, percent increase in your uh, neck extension, neck flexion, lateral flexion, um, if you improve it by so much percent, you decrease the potential for concussion or um, injury? There is a landmark study done uh, by Don Comstock and her group at the University of um, uh, Colorado. And what they did is they took a look at, um, uh, I think the study was done over five states. There were 50 high schools involved in over 2,500 students, maybe even more than that. I want to say maybe double that. And it was done over the 2010-2011 academic year. And, and before the year started, they went in and they measured uh, all the kids' neck circumferences and they also measured their isometric flexion, extension, and lateral flexion strength. And they followed these kids over the 2010-2011 academic year, and they represented athletes of all different types of sports, males and females. And after factoring out gender in sport, the biggest determinant of um, concussive injury was strength of the neck. In fact, in, in the conclusion, she said that for every um, five pounds of neck strength, uh, it reduced concussion risk 10%. So when you think about that, if you're five pounds stronger in the neck, you know each five pounds, it cuts out 10% of your concussive risk. It's pretty significant. Hey, you know. We're talking one rep max? No, we're talking about uh, they measured the isometric strength of the kids' necks. Okay. Yeah. So if you get up to 50 pounds, you're almost 100% clear of having an injury. Well, you're, I don't know if you're ever 100% when you're getting hit in the head, but it is reducing brain exposure because it's slowing the head down. Definitely. Um, with getting back with athletes coming out of COVID and getting back to um, play and competition, how would you design uh, a program for the athlete coming out of this pandemic? And what would you, how would you sit down with your coach and your sports medicine department in order to ensure that these athletes are taken care of and uh, to decrease the potential or likelihood of um, injury because I've talked with a bunch of coaches who are now you know, a bunch of strength coaches who are now put in a position where they have to sit down and have discussions, open and honest conversations with their coaches in the sports medicine on how they're going to return these athletes once they get back to campus. 
And I think everybody needs to understand that the head coach has to really listen to these professionals to make sure that um, these athletes are taken care of. Well, it's a really good question. And like you say, one that everybody's struggling with right now, but in addition to following all the CDC uh, social distancing guidelines for airborne disease, um, as far as athletes going back into competition, you've got to make sure that they are, and we talked about this already earlier in the show, as a strength coach, my job is to protect him from the rigors of sport or her from the rigors of sport. So we have got to allow these uh, athletes time to prepare their bodies before they go into competition. We just can't throw them piecemeal into competition and not expect them to get injured. We've got to gradually, like um, college football starts off with, um, you know, training camp where they are just go going into practice. They start without pads. They move them into pads gradually. Um, hopefully there's been an off season where they've built up their strength levels to prevent um, injury. Um, it's got to be a slow phased in process before the kids go into competition and it can't be uh, let's just throw them in and, and get the season done. I think I think everybody and, and, I, and I've you know as I've said I've talked with a bunch of coaches and I think everybody's got to expect and assume that all the athletes are coming back at ground zero. Mm -hmm. Deconditioned and they're detrained, and if you if you have a head coach who's going to go, okay, we're going to start with two a days the first week they're back. You're gonna you're gonna you you you're just you're you're opening yourself up for a triage situation. If you're a college athlete listening to this, understand that this is a coach's risk aversion strategy. You should be coming back stronger than ever. Exactly. And strength is your best protection because as I said before, um, when we strengthen muscles, which is going to improve performance, we're also reducing injury. We're increasing bone mineral density. We're increasing the strength and thickness of your tendons and ligaments. So all of a sudden you have a more structurally sound uh, joint and more structurally sound joints are less apt to get uh, injured. So uh, the stronger you are, it's not saying that you're bulletproof, but uh, you certainly are giving yourself a better chance. Coach, um, what, uh, what does a uh, professional strength and conditioning coach uh, do with his own children? What, uh, I mean, you don't have to give, give all the secrets away, but in general, um, you know, how do you look at, you know, helping to train your, your, your own children? Well, you know, I, I often ask myself, I, if you were to ask my children, I have two older daughters and a younger son, if it's a blessing or a curse to have a strength coach <laughs> as a dad, um, I have, I have trained them, um, a long time and um, uh, during the uh, quarantine, I was training my 12 year old son two times a week. And uh, the younger you go in training kids, the more it has to be a one-on-one -on -one supervised situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it was with me, it was time with dad. And um, obviously the intensity of the exercise has to be a lot more reduced and then you can slowly over many years uh, ramp that up. Um, I always wanted them wanting more from the uh, workout when they, when they first started. So I started really light, really um, basic movements, um, teaching them the proper rep mechanics, going nice and slow, lifting the weight, not throwing the weight, make sure they're going full range of motion and um, teaching them the proper mechanics. And, um, and then as we went on, we ramped up their intensity. So they started to feel it. And um, uh, we added more exercises so that you cover the whole body, it doesn't matter what, whether you're a football player, a basketball player, tennis player, you're going to use all your muscles. 
So the training application is that you have to train all of them. So we, I take them through a total body uh, workout that doesn't take more than 30 minutes. And um, uh, if they're training hard enough, two times a week is all they need. They need, a lot of people think more is better when it comes to exercise. It's like everything else. Uh, it's best done in moderation, especially when you're training hard. Your body does need to recover from the exercise. So, um, uh, but I, I do that, again, as a parent to protect them from the rigors of sport. Now, would you say that, um, obviously, the younger ages, um, it's really, it's more structural. You're just trying to almost train their nerves into doing the motions the proper way. Um, and if that's true, what, what ages do you start? And then what age do you start to kind of load them a little more? Well, again, the research, again, shows that your physiology at age eight or even younger, you know, the thing I tell parents is when you put them in competition, you better prepare them because when you put them in full-blown competition, their risk exposure is 100%. So if you don't prepare their bodies before competition, um, they're going in unprepared, which is going to set them up for injury. And, and the problem in the United States now is we're going full blow comp competition when these kids are five. Hmm. Well, can they, can they prepare their bodies when they're five? And the answer is absolutely yes. But you can put a five-year-old in a weight room and say, go in there and lift weights and shut the door and expect them to do it correctly. It has to be strictly supervised. Uh, and the younger you go, maybe the, you want to do body weight type exercise, calisthenics with them, push-ups, sit-ups, uh, dipping exercises, body weight squats, starting there and then slowly ramping them into barbells and dumbbells and getting them on machines and, again, teaching them how to do it properly. Yeah, once again, it's one of those things that less is actually more. Exactly. And especially exactly. At, at the, at the, at, as you start younger, you want to also incorporate it being enjoyable for them. So yeah. It's something that they don't dread to do. Um, and as they get older, I mean, it, you, as you said, you can ramp it up. But also, I'm sure there's a part of you that you want to show your 12-year-old son that dad still got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you got jujitsu for you're that, right, Mark. Mark. One one thing I do with my younger clients is is I'll throw. They have a challenge that they have to do every workout. So one challenge, I, you know, I have a basketball hoop out in my driveway, and they have to hit three shots. You know, when they're when they're doing that along with their workout between their upper body and lower body, and I'll have cones out there. I have a frisbee and a frisbee target. They have to throw it at the target at three different positions. They have to run and get the frisbee, bring it back. You know, you want to make it fun hmm. to the kids. Definitely. Mark, where, um, where, what are you, what are you going to do? Where do you, where, where can people get in touch with you? Um, and where do you see the profession going in the next five to 10 years? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, where the profession is going, um, rather than where it's going, I'm going to talk about where it should go. I, I, I think that um, uh, one of the questions that I'm asked uh, consistently as a strength coach is what is my philosophy on strength training? And to me, that's one of the most annoying questions because if you take a look at what philosophy is, philosophy is a system of beliefs. And I can't guide exercise by a system of what I believe is correct. I've got to guide exercise, uh, not by philosophy, but by physiological principles. So you have to follow the science. And, um, uh, the thing I see in the profession now is the lack of science. It's uh, people going to the internet and the internet is a good thing, but it, it, it has good information and it has bad information. And um, the unfortunate thing about exercise is people get 
um, energized by exercise that is kind of funky. And um, so now you see this battling ropes type of stuff. And people tend to gravitate towards the esoteric, uh, funky looking stuff. And a lot of times that funky looking stuff is not only dangerous, but it's counterproductive. And uh, so one thing I have to educate people to is it's always about the fundamentals, the um, basic multi-joint movements going slow and full range of motion and sticking with the fundamentals. And that's what's gonna get you the best results, not necessarily all the funky stuff. So to answer your question, I, I, I think that practitioners really need to guide themselves based on the principles of uh, physiology and, and not necessarily what everybody else is doing. Um, so uh, follow the principles of being prudent, being productive, being practical, being purposeful. Uh, if you, if you, um, if you don't have a plan to follow, uh, then you fall for everything. You can fall for everything. Um, uh, you mentioned me being a, a, a mentor uh, and stuff like that. And I, I think that the best mentors are the ones that steer their students to the science. And, and that's why I was, you know, uh, took a lot of pride in, in the people that work for me, you included, because you did take the next step. You, you let science fall. You weren't doing what Mark Asanovich did. You were doing what was shown in the science. And that's, that's what I think is, is, is really important. Now, having said that, though, practitioners also need to, strength training is not only a uh, science, it is an art. And you have to develop those personal relational skills to um, relate with athletes. You know, we always talk about athletes don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and it's it really is true mm. and um, you have to have that ability to relate to kids to um, connect where they are and who they are and know their learning styles and that means not sitting behind your desk when the kids are in the weight room that's rolling up your sleeves and getting dirty getting in there and coaching them and, and being on the floor and um, authentically being transparent with them and um, uh, you know, loving them up and, and getting to know them and blending that art with the science is what really makes a really good uh, practitioner, I think. Awesome. And I think what athletes, athletes need to understand by loving them up, sometimes it is tough love. I mean, it's it, is, not always, it is tough love. Yeah. It's, not always, it's not always hugs and kisses. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> Being well, where can uh, people get a hold of you and find you uh, on the internet? Well, um, I've got an email address. Uh, it's uh, mark at propumped.com. I've got a uh, website. Uh, it's coachaprotraining.com. And uh, I tweet every now and then. Uh, I'm kind of a dinosaur when it comes to that stuff, but um, I believe it's, it's, uh, coach underscore a six, two, six, two is my, uh, handle, I guess you call it. Um, so, well done. Uh, so that would be a good start on how to reach me. Okay. Well, I know you said uh, in the beginning of the show that it was an honor to come on here, but, uh, it's really been our honor to have you on. Uh, so thank you for all of your, the information you provided here. It's, uh, I think it's a lot for people to absorb um, and it's important. Yeah, Mark. Well, it, is, it is important. And I think, I think platforms like uh, what you guys are providing is, is what's going to educate parents and athletes. And so it, it has really truly been an honor for me to be able to share some uh, information with you. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate you coming on. It's all you listening. Um, Mark, you got more, buddy? Yeah, I just want to. I, I just want to thank you for you know the twenty, thirty years that we've known each other, and, and your, not only your not only your professional guidance, 
but your personal uh, friendship. And, and I, 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 I truly mean that. And I think as, as coaches, you, 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 the saying, you stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and I definitely consider you one of the, one of the giants in the, in the profession. And I appreciate you taking the time out of, out of your day to not only join us in this podcast, but everything that you've done, not only for me, but for my family. And, I, and it's been an honor to uh, be one of your branches off of your coaching tree. Well, thanks, Mark, it, uh, for the kind words. It's, it, I know when I've been a good mentor when I can start turning around and learning from my students. So, and I've learned from you. So thank you for that. No, thank you. And, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, if anybody's got questions about training and, uh, and training their neck, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, recommend reaching out to Coach Asanovich more than anybody else. Um, so uh, once again, thank you for your time. I hope all is well with you and your family. And uh, for all of those that are listening, thanks again for listening. If you have any questions, concerns, want to be a guest on the show, you can reach us at info at athletehackers.com. We're on Spotify, uh, Apple, YouTube. Uh, share all those links, subscribe, and uh, that'll help us continue to bring guests on like Coach Asanovich. Coach, thank you again. Um, hopefully uh, we could have you back on the show again because I'm sure there's a lot more ground to cover. All right, guys. Stay safe. Stay strong. I'm a best. Tune in, everybody. All right. Peace. See ya. Bye.